Hello, and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Baton Rouge. I'm Reverend Kale Wedekam, and I celebrate that we get to worship together. And I want to extend a special welcome to our visitors and those worshiping online and through our television ministry today. Today we will hear a story from Saul and Ananias about how they overcame hatred and how we might do the same today. Today's reading is from the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus called Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the high priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? among those who invoked his na this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chiefs? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the next week. Greetings, friends, and a special hello to all of my enemies out there today. I'm glad that you've joined. Now, that would be a weird way to begin a sermon, wouldn't it? Especially for a Christian person like myself. A weird thing to acknowledge the resentments I'm still holding in this house of worship. Especially, you probably know, as Christian people, that Jesus in John chapter 17 tells us that we are to be one in Christ, which would make it all the more strange that I keep my friends and my enemies on a day like today. 
But if Jesus told us that that's not what we're to be about, and it would be weird for me to do it here today, why do we hold on to those resentments in so many other areas of our life? Now, I try not to hate, but I confess my own struggles with this. It's not something I want to be part of my life. But my toddler recently picked up the word hate at school this year. So thank you, other people's children. (laughs) Man, other people's children are sure the cause of a lot of our strife, isn't it? But we've tried to discourage her use of that word. Although, uh, so we say we don't hate things in our family, but she has found a list of a few things that we will let her hate. Um, And so now she'll say randomly in the car, Daddy, I hate getting eaten by an alligator. I'm like, yes, baby, I would hate that too. Forgiveness can be really hard, especially when we've been hurt deeply. And I don't think we can arrive to those places of deliverance and forgiveness for, of deep personal harm if we can't get over the shallow hates that are so prevalent in our culture and our world today. It's rampant in our online culture. It was rampant in the world Saul lived in. He had that kind of hate and he acted on it. It's the kind of hate that divides neighbors and judges whole people groups as evil. It's the kind of hate that we let build for the same people that we are commanded by Jesus to love, to pray for, and to serve. It's no secret that America is becoming increasingly divided. As demonstrated by the terrible events this weekend, and in this sermon, which I prepared on Tuesday, I've decided to not change a word. Because I still want to say that I think we're giving far too much allegiance, far too much attention, and far too much of our life to this losing game of politics in the games of men. Pew Research in 2023 released poll results that show how we all really feel about the political landscape. 65% of poll respondents said that they feel exhausted when thinking about politics. Over half, 55%, said that politics makes them feel angry. Only 10% described hopefulness as their response to politics. And even fewer, 4% of respondents said that they feel excited when thinking about our political landscape. Our division has spurred the creation of groups like Braver Angels, um, who exist for the sole purpose of helping people make sense of their relationships now that we've given politics such a hold on us and made it this idol that some of us worship more than God. Social media is not helping. It's not your friend in this case. And a growing number of us recognize that politics is tearing us apart and people are starting to more and more feel like political nomads. But it's not just in national politics. In East Baton Rouge Parish, we can't even hold a school board meeting without character defamation and suspicion of our opponents. Division is happening within the church as differences in our scriptural interpretation are causing whole denominations to splinter and people to leave the people that they had once committed to and find new bodies to worship with. As America approaches another election cycle, I expect that this is going to bring out the worst in us. So I think we should get prepared. The slander and the hate is rather predictable, don't you think? Can't you already hear what other, uh, the other side from you is going to say after a certain speech or a certain event. So I think as Christian people, we must be wise. We must see through what's happening. And I think the story of Saul gives me hope and wisdom about how I am to live as a Jesus follower in this divided world, how I might even be able to heal the divisions in this world. So Saul was a Jewish man, He was also Greek, so he straddled two divided worlds. He had a foot in both camps, if you will. He was a Pharisee, and so his whole job was to know the religious laws and keep people following them. This is the same Saul who had more famously become known as Paul, but that is not until after our story today. Saul was at the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and he began from there the pursuit of Jesus' followers to punish them, breathing out murderous threats against them. He wanted to protect what he knew was right. To Saul, the followers of Jesus' way were his enemies. 
They were no longer neighbors, and he'd bought into a narrative so deeply that persecuting them was actually a way to show his devotion to his cause. Paul loved his empire too much, and it justified his hatred of people who were also part of that empire. And remember what Jesus says, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Has this happened since Paul's time? As I think back through our Western history, has there been rhetoric that perpetuated the hatred of whole groups of people or justified their persecution, justified their enslavement? After they've been freed, justified and perpetuated laws that kept them in sort of states of enslavement? Has there been anti-Semitism for thousands of years? And where has that led us? If we look at what's happened in the past and the result, we don't want to go there again. But not just out there, I think we should always look at ourselves. In what ways is hatred happening in you? As Saul became a person to be feared, his life was betraying the very faith and the very principles that he thought he was living for. And if anyone had a past to overcome, it was Saul. And then Jesus enters. Saul becomes physically blinded from this encounter. And ironically, what's notable about a blind person is that they are utterly dependent on the people around them, on their neighbors, whether they are Jew or Gentile. What a reminder of our reality, that we need our neighbors. Revelation tells us that heaven will be all tribes, all nations, people of every tongue, worshiping God together. So I think when we as Christian people bridge divides that sin puts up, that is how we build heaven on earth. Like Paul, I think we all have scales clouding our, our vision. And only Jesus can help us overcome that. And if Christ's followers can't do it, then who in the world can? Saul would depend on another follower of the way to regain his sight and gain these new eyes, this new vision. Enter Ananias. Now, Ananias had heard of Saul. He knew that Saul was an enemy, and this is the very person that God sends him to. I think of what Ananias had to get over in himself to go on this mission. Jonah couldn't do it. When God sent Jonah in the Old Testament to go to Nineveh to go minister to those wicked people over there, he fled. He went the other way. That's how he ended up in the fish. Ananias knew that this mission could be a death sentence. He told God. He talked with him. He said, I've heard the reports. I know that he's not one of my own. He's actually hurting my kind of people. But Ananias believed that God was greater than human divisions. Ananias set aside his judgments. He set aside rumors. He even set aside some of the truths about Saul. And he listened to God's command to go and restore him. And we sit here today having inherited the good that came from that decision of the gospel coming to Gentile, non-Jewish people. Like Saul, some of us might have to surrender our past and trade it for a new way. Like Ananias, some of us might have to ask Jesus to help us overcome our judgments. I confess that this is only a recent epiphany, that it's something I need to be praying about rather than just harboring these hates myself. I've noticed these thoughts of anger, thoughts of disappointment, even maybe hatred rise up, especially when I see a post online from someone I love or thought I loved and I love them and just think, I wish that they wouldn't have shared that. Or imagine if they used that platform to share scripture and share Jesus instead. Or when I break my ankles running to the comments to see what everyone else is saying about this and how mad everyone is and who's on my side and am I going to get upset again or am I going to be like, yeah, get them. I too have to lay my judgments at Jesus' feet and ask for a new heart, not a hard heart. The good news of the gospel in this story is that God transforms people who need it. Saul would go on to set up churches across the ancient world and he would write them letters of encouragement and correction, which became part of our New Testament in the Bible, words that still prove true today. To the Ephesians, he wrote that Christ alone is our peace, 
that Christ breaks down the dividing wall of hostility. Now, whether that was a real wall in the temple that separated Jews and Gentiles, or it's the walls we put up between people, we need those words. He wrote to Timothy that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul demonstrated humility. Humility is what it takes to admit our idolatry, to admit our hatred. And when he did, Jesus didn't just wipe his past clean. He actually kept that past and he used it to show the magnificent reach of God's love. So how are you telling the ways that Jesus took what you once were, who you once were, and using it for a testimony? Through Jesus, shame turns to surrender and our guilt turns to gratitude. And Saul's redemption is made possible because of the faith of Ananias. Ananias' trust in God to be greater is what emboldened him to be that vessel of God's grace. When I think of God's grace and being vessels of God's grace, I think of the FUMC youth, who as the youth pastor, I get to lead on their mission trips. And we recently came home from a youth mission trip to Oljato, Utah. For 30 years, FUMC has traveled to Utah to serve with the Navajo Nation. We often complete construction projects, but the highlight of the mission is our students' leadership of Vacation Bible School for the local kids and teenagers. Our students plan the stories, they plan the skits, the snacks, the games, the songs, but most importantly, they build relationships with these people, some of which last for years as our students have returned and watched kids go from elementary age all the way up to college and maintained those friendships. But this year was a different kind of VBS. After the first two days, I was riding home on the bus and I asked one of the local children, so what did you learn about Jesus today in Vacation Bible School? He shrugged his shoulders and he said, uh, nothing, I don't know. Now whether that was just a kid giving a kid answer or whether it was the truth, when I shared that with our youth, I was blown away by their response because they knew that their mission there was to make disciples. And so that answer was not good enough for them. That day, our students met for over an extra hour to revise their approach to VBS, to adjust the prayer and the storytelling, even being intentional about their conversations throughout the day to bring the stories back up and talk about Jesus more. Jesus is what they talked about from start to finish. By the last day, those same local kids were sprinting to our bus, jumping on and asking, what are we gonna learn about Jesus today? What they meant is, what am I going to learn about Jesus from you? The kids saw our youth as the people who would show them who Jesus is. It gave us license to be bold. It gave us the challenge to put words to our faith about how Jesus gives us hope or love or peace in chaotic times, how he calls us to live differently. They pursued with urgency their mission to build this kingdom of God, not their own mission, not their own kingdom. And I love that not once in seven days of powerful mission and ministry did the topics that divide our church come up or the topics that divide our nation come up because there was enough to be found in the gospel that it didn't need to. We have the gospel for our divisions to show us a way past them because the gospel is about freeing sinners, about bridging divides. See, we have a common goal Our goal is to grow in holiness of heart and life. The sin that's often called out in the Old Testament is idolatry, pride and arrogance. So what idols have we erected? So Jesus, I believe his ministry would have frequently crossed our party lines and worked for the good of all people. He would have bestowed dignity and life where it was needed. So why wouldn't we do the same? In Utah, our youth knew that people were looking to them for an example of Jesus, for that peace that was promised. They were to make disciples, and that is all of our calling. The mission trip is really just practice for how we are to live all the time at home. Now, I'm not naive. I know that home, it can be harder. With our complicated relationships, the tangled hurts in our pasts, the hurts that we've inflicted and also received from others. And that's why I think the story of Saul is so needed. Because people pointed at him and said, isn't this the same Saul who was arresting 
my cousins a few days before who was hurting us. How can he be trusted? Well, he can be trusted because God's love is that grand. God's love that is grand enough to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. And Saul, when he found that grace, Scripture says that at once he began to preach that Jesus is the Son of God. And in doing so, he preached that Jesus is the one worthy of devotion. Not people, not powers, not principalities. Paul didn't dare compare himself to, to God or to Jesus. He was humble than that, more humble than that. But he showed that Jesus is the one worthy of devotion. Not, uh, and he showed how to establish a right order of our life and put Jesus on the throne. And so people's response to him is that they were baffled. They couldn't believe that this was the same man. And so if they say of you, isn't this the guy who used to be all about fill in the blank? Or the girl who led the charge against those people or for this? Yes, yes it is. And they got over themselves. They became all about Jesus. How about we get over ourselves a little bit too and be all about Jesus? Not just by what we declare, because Saul declared to be an agent of the religious establishment, but by instead our treatment of each other, by the way that we bear with one another in love, even those who should be our enemies, by the way that we overcome those dividing hostilities. So if this is you, if you realize this tendency to hate that bubbles up, or this dividing hostility splintering your relationships any relationships you have at work, in your family, or if it's clouding your worldview and you can't seem to shake it, what can you do? First, I think we need to pray. Pray, God, help me not to hate. Search the Psalms and the Scriptures and the Proverbs for those ancient wisdoms. Come talk with your pastor. Maybe you look up braver angels and you attend one of their in-person courses or you look up one of their online e-courses to learn how to have those conversations. Maybe you sign up for The Pour Over, which is a newly minted uh, Christian-based news site, neutral news site, that pairs the major news stories of today with scripture and prayer. Maybe you are a voice and a force for calm in this chaos. Maybe you have your stance, but you refuse conspiracy or gossip. Maybe you use your platforms to point everyone to Jesus first. Maybe you only allow for respect. We need big help with this, and I need big help with this. But just like it would be uncharacteristic of me to say, hello, friends and enemies, it's the same for you. Our youth understood that. They are a great example to us. So I think we need to be wise. We need to see through and not be played. We need to be faithful. Are you trusting well, who are you trusting in more than God? Will you recognize that hatred is not just out there, but that sometimes it can be in here and needs to get out? Recognizing that the problem is not out there, but maybe the problem is ours. Who are you stuck hating? And is your heart so calloused as to place them outside the realm of your love? Not God's love. We can accept that God loves everybody, but your love. Like Proverbs, I think we should guard our heart against this hardening, to not become like Pharaoh or like Saul, who were so blinded by their certainty that hate filled up in their closed-off heart. So yes, there is much opportunity to be disciples who transform the world to look like heaven, to love God, ourself, and others. Martin Luther King Jr.'s voice still reminds us that there is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. So church, we must go out and baffle them with our love and with our ways of being. If we do not prove that Christ can overcome this hostility, who will? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today, in whatever way we need to, Show us our idols and help us to tear them down. Help us not to hate. 
There is no body of Christ but the one that we have together today. Lord, show us our neighbors are the ones you created and that they are deserving of our respect and our love. Show us a path together. Give us new eyes for this world. On our own, Lord, we fail at this. We hold on to our divides. This becomes our sin, and we don't want it. Instead, Lord, help us hold on to Christ, who is our hope. Christ who defeated the grave. Christ whose kingdom reigns now. His unshakable kingdom today and for everlasting is alive, and we are its vessels. Lord, give us hope and faith in that kingdom, and may we reside first in it before any other, and give glory to Jesus alone. Amen.